Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon, church. It's been a long time since I've been here, and I, I can't even count how long, but it has been a couple of years, at least. At least. But it's good to come home. In fact, I, was, I didn't sleep much like to tell the truth, because I was excited, because I'm coming home to Willesden, my London home church. And just before I say anything else, I'm, I bring greetings from our union president, Pastor Eglin Brooks, who's also adopted son of Willesden. In fact, you know his family very well, Sister Tina, who is here, and the family they are here in fact, practically every week. So we have a very close connection to Willesden. And yes, Sister Margaret says hello. She's on ministry today. She's at a women's retreat doing her thing. And ladies, if you know what she's like, she's doing her thing. That's all I can say on that one. And of course, the young men, they're doing their thing too. I believe Aaron is be here sometime this afternoon doing something. But everybody's doing something, all serving the Lord. That's wonderful. Worsden is very special because I want to let you, in today, let you know something. In two weeks' time, two weeks' time, on the 24th of June, it will be 32 years since Margaret and I walked up here in front of this aisle. Did anybody remember what I said? Who was there remember what I said? I didn't say I do. Does anybody remember what I said? Who was here? You don't remember? Oh, yes. That's what I said. Remember? Those of you, that's what I said. And it's still, oh, yes. We give God thanks for his watchful care over us for these 32 years, which seem to have gone by very quickly, to be honest. To be honest, gone by very quickly. We've changed a little. One of us has got a little bit more rounder. I was looking at some pictures the other day, and I was shocked. I couldn't believe it was me. So I'm working on it. I've got to do something about it, I said to myself. So watch this space, praise the Lord. We'll see what God can do. Church, are you, are you all right? Come on now. Have you felt God blessing you over this week? You know, we've had a rough couple of years, very rough years, few years. But throughout it all, God has been good to us, hasn't he? Have you felt his presence in your life even more so than ever before? Well, from now, you must give him all the glory and the honor and the praise. And I want to share just a few words with you this afternoon. And I want to thank our young man for our scripture reading today. He gave you a challenge. Do you know what the challenge was? He didn't tell you where to find the book. But did you find it? Good. What was it? What was the, what was the chapter? What was it? Matthew chapter 14. 22 to 30. He just said Matthew 22 to 33. I said, wonderful. Challenge them. To know their Bibles. You see, he didn't tell you where it was found. He made you look for it and think about it. Thank you, young man, for that. I saw some people scratching their heads. Didn't know where to look. You knew the story, but didn't know where to find it. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we are so thankful to you for giving us another Sabbath day. Lord, we could have been anywhere today, but you saw it fit to allow us to be in your presence, to give you glory, honor, and praise. And Lord, as you have placed me in the pulpit this afternoon, I ask dear God that I will be removed, but you will be seen instead. Take away any nervousness, take away anything that will prevent a message a word from reaching somebody today. Because, dear God, somebody needs to hear a word from you. And, dear God, at the end, somebody needs to make a decision for you. So be with us now, tabernacle, and let your presence walk through this waiting congregation is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, technology is a wonderful thing, but sometimes it's a headache. I'm getting used to using it, as I'm told I need to. In our scripture reading today, we have the story of Jesus walking on water. And you know, it occurs in three out of the four Gospels. 
But it is only in Matthew's gospel that we have the addition of the part where Peter asked Jesus to call him and Peter's subsequent swimming lesson. Now, most of the sermons that I've heard on this passage about Jesus walking on water, they all focus on Peter, who finds himself sinking into stormy seas when he begins to doubt Jesus. But if we only focus on the moment that Peter sinks, we will have missed the most wonderful and promising part of this story. You see, we, we focus on Peter sinking, but you can do that if you want to, and it seems like most churches do, but that's not the whole story. Did you know that? Now, I want to encourage you today to look past Peter's failure, put it aside for a moment, and take a look at the promise that is found in those a few verses. Peter walks on water. He walked with Jesus for a little while, takes a few steps, then sinks. And yes, it was, but for a brief moment, Peter did something very spectacular. He walked on water. Now, in doing so, Peter showed great faith in getting out of the boat in the first place and going to Jesus. Now, the reason he sinks is not because it was wrong to get out of the boat. Peter only sinks when his faith wavers. Now, I declare to you this morning that the greatest failure in this story is not Peter, but the rest of the disciples. Are you with me now? Where is Pastor going with this? I tell you that the greatest failure is not Peter, but the rest of the disciples who sat huddled in the boat, still wondering if they were seeing a ghost. Now, Peter's faith might have been weak, but it was much stronger than the rest of the disciples. Peter was the only one with boldness to get up and, 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 and make a move. All the other disciples, they were there. They saw Jesus. They heard the discussion. They too could have responded, but they chose to remain exactly where they were, wondering, now, they all got to the shore safely, but only Peter had the water walk experience. How much if we would have missed if we all remembered that Peter sank? Now, this is a passage of a promise. It's a promise to all of us. And if you respond in faith to the call of God, you too can walk on water. And I want you to get that today. There's a promise that was made to Peter. Peter, come. That was a promise right there. And so there's a big lesson in this. If you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. You see, the promise was given. Peter challenged Jesus. In fact, he thought Jesus would let him off the hook. He thought he would when he said, I even thought, you know, Peter would say, Jesus would say to him, no, don't worry, you can stay there, I will come to you. But Jesus said, come. Now, now that come is a loaded word. We don't actually see it, but, but now Peter had to rationalize so many things in his mind. Well, I just spoke to Jesus and he said, I must come. That was a miracle happening right there. Now, we talk about wanting to work miracles, wanting to do great things for Christ, but yet we don't want to compromise the comfort and safety of the boats. That's the other disciples. Miracles, by definition, are risky. They defy what we believe to be the usual order of things. We can't walk on water without getting out of the boat, without taking a risk. That's what Peter was doing. You see, he had to make a calculated decision as he looked at the situation. Miracles are not a result of practical living and common sense. In fact, miracles make no sense at all. In fact, none of our faith makes sense to folks still sitting in the boat. A baby born of a virgin doesn't make any sense. An empty tomb doesn't make any sense. Choosing death in order to live 
doesn't make sense. Ruling by serving doesn't make sense. Being first by bringing up the rear doesn't make sense. And it sure doesn't make sense to step out of a perfectly good boat at the height of a storm. But that's what Peter had to wrestle with. He had to decide, well, the water that I'm standing in is just by my feet. He's got to believe that he can now, by stepping out of the boat, a place of safety, into much deeper water, and everything is going to be okay. He was already struggling in the boat, but he had to believe by faith that he could step out of the boat. And you have the disciples there. They're watching all of this, seeing what was going to happen. They saw Peter think about it. Wrestle with it in his mind, but then he plucked up the courage and said, you know what, I'm going. So Peter, by faith, steps out of the boat. And yet you have the rest of this, the disciples watching. I wonder if they were probably cheering him on. I, I wonder there could have been. I, I wonder if they were just looking at him in amazement or trying to discourage him. Peter, don't be silly. Don't be a fool. What do you think you're doing? Yes, 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 you're in the boat here. It's safe here. Where are you going on that water? It's deep. You're going to drown, Peter. What do you think you're doing? Well, Peter ignores that and steps out. You see, Jesus is standing there outside the boat, making no sense at all, standing on top of water. And I like how what Jesus does here. He doesn't come to us in the way that we would expect rowing up in another boat, he is walking on the water. And instead of leaping into the boat and saying, well, how's it going? Don't worry, everything is going to be all right. He stops outside of the boat, standing on the water, hears Peter's call, and says, come. Now, Jesus could have chided those other disciples for staying in the boat. But I want you to understand that if this church, our church, Wilsden Seventh-day Adventist Church, is to grow, it depends on the ones who dare to get out of the boat. The ones who dare to believe. The ones who dare to learn. The ones who dare to lead. Now, you cannot lead with one foot in church and the other outside. It doesn't work like that. It's either all or nothing at all. Think about it for a moment. Think of ourselves here. We're comfortable. This is our boat of safety. But Jesus is calling each and every one of us to step outside of the boat. Take a risk. And go and do something for him. Now, Peter takes an incredible risk in getting out of the boat on a dark and stormy night. But the key here is he doesn't put one toe outside of the boat until Jesus says, come. You see, there's power right there. And there's so much that goes with that. If Jesus is not in you, a part of your experience, where are you going? You can't go and do anything without Jesus. If he's not near your boat, then it would be crazy to get out and try to walk on water. You can't do anything on your own. But when God appears, when Jesus comes on the scene, new possibilities open before us. And as we listen to his guiding voice, we can do many wonderful things. If God says it's okay, then you can take that to the bank. My friends, we are not called to be reckless, but we are called to trust. But the problem is, we live in a society, or in a world where trust is out the window, basically. The watchwords we hear today are words like protection, security, safeguarding, whether it is the government, the health care, social services, or financial institutions. We all hear those words as organizations describe their goal and objectives. Yes, we must protect our children, make sure social funding is good, have our safe schools, etc. We have a whole branch in government which deals with security. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But when we let our concern for security and safety spill over into our faith, our faith vanishes and we sink into the sea. Our faith means nothing if it doesn't mean risk. 
Faith and trust go hand in hand. And that means to do something and take a risk. Risk and trust are risky business. Sounds a mixture of words, but it's true. So I'm going to try something. Elder Keith, do you trust me? Hmm? To a, he says, you hear that? He says, to a point. To a point. Only to a point. Okay, you hear that? Only to a point. But let's see what how that, that point is. See, I'm wiping my forehead now, you see. So, do you trust me enough? Hold on. Have you got any money on you? No? Nothing in your wallet? You got cards? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can use cards. But, I, yeah, I can use cards. So, do you trust me enough to give me your wallet with your cards in it? Hmm? You hear that could work? Can I have your wallet, please? Say, hey, trust me. Yeah. Hmm? Hmm? You see how he's smart? His wallet is on his phone. <laughs> what can I say? I'll give it to you back later. You can have it back. But you see, you see the world we live in? Wallet is on the phone. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. I don't know how I can access any of the money from the phone. But then again, I can use it the same way, can't I? Touch business. Yeah. So that's not bad, actually. That's a good idea. Well, not in all of them, you know. I see them go to the shop and they just do this. Yeah, Danny, they just present it like that and it reads. So that's a good, oh, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. I can work something out with that, you know. But Keith has given me his phone. Elder Keith has given me his phone, which has his wallet, has his money on it. And he's trusting me with it. That he will get it back at some time. Didn't say when. But he's expecting to get it back, right? You see, he trusts me enough to know that I will look after it and give it back to him. And there's a lesson right there, you see. You can't tell me that you trust me until you're ready to give me your money and let me hold it for you. Until you do that, the trust is just breath air, just hot air. But he has demonstrated, yeah, I, I trust Kevin. I know Kevin will give it me back. That's trust. And it's the same with faith. You can say, oh, I have faith in God. All you want. But until you get out of the boat, it's only hot air coming from your mouth. That's all it is. You can say, I love the Lord. You can say, you can say I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can quote, with God all things are possible. You can shout it, uh, time and time and time again. But until we get ourselves out of the boat, we haven't trusted at all. We shout it again and again, and yet we sit comfortably in our boats, calling the ones who get out of the boat foolish and impractical. And we look at those who get out of the boat and we condemn them when they, their lack of faith starts to sink. And we are completely unaware that even though they may be sinking to the bottom of the sea, their faith is greater than ours. Because they made a step in the first place. Friends, if you are going to do something for God, you've got to have faith and you've got to trust him. The disciples, they didn't display any trust or faith that night because they were fearful. But Peter demonstrated to them what it means to trust in God, what it can do. If Peter did not trust in Jesus that night, could he walk on water? No. And that is a promise right there. When you respond to the call of God by faith, you can do anything. In fact, brethren, let me tell you something. We have no business claiming we have any faith whatsoever until we have been willing to get out of the boat when Jesus calls. And if we listen, take some time and listen carefully and quietly, 
we will hear Jesus calling us. We will hear him calling us by name. Calling us to step out from where we are to where he wants us to be. But often that step means you've got to move from somewhere that is comfortable. Somewhere where you feel safe. Because we don't really like taking risks. You know, we like to, to, to be comfortable where we are. We don't like to take risks very much. But you see, brethren, when we have that position, we, we deny ourselves a wealth of experience, a wealth of opportunity that God has in store for us. Now, the call of God is the same now as it was back then, and it is for everyone. And it's Matthew chapter, 10, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, which says, go and make disciples. In fact, folks, turn to that in your Bibles. I want you to read it with me. Turn in your Bibles, please. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. When you found it, let me hear you say amen. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. You found it? Okay. It says, go and make disciples of some nations. Did I say something wrong? What did I say? What should it be? All nations. In other words, wisdom. You need to go out to Wilsdon community and make disciples of all the people who live in this area. That is your responsibility. That's what God is calling you to do. Let's read the text. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So the commission it's clear, and it is represented in this same story. It begins with the disciples, and later Jesus joins them on the lake. And they were going to the other side. Now, a few years ago now, I had the privilege of going to Israel, and I learned that the other side of the lake, of the Sea of Galilee, is Gentile territory. You see, when I went there, we went to the Sea of Galilee, and a few of us pastors we saw went to the Galilee Sea, and, you know, we, we had this story in our mind. And we heard how the water operates and the, how the sea operates. And we got in a boat. We was going to cross the lake. And while we were crossing, somebody was telling the story. And it seemed that God wanted to give us a little demonstration because the water got a little busy. Just a touch busy. Now me, I, well, I won't tell you what I did. I just sat there in my quiet praying, Lord, not today, please. You know, I, I don't need a Peter experience right now. Just get us to the other side. But it seems like the water was troubled just for our experience. We made it to the other side, and yes, it is Gentile territory. And what I learned from that experience is that every time Jesus goes to the other side, he's going to be with the Gentiles. Right, brothers and sisters, this church exists to make disciples, to draw men and women into a relationship with Jesus, to teach our children about Jesus and how much he loves them. And we must not forget that. The day you forget that, the day we cease to be a church that, that looks out for everybody, that seeks to, inter, um, to integrate and challenge the commu community, we become a cruise liner. Just trying to make sure that the passengers are comfortable and having a good time. And by the way, we're good at that. We're good at having a good time by ourselves, for ourselves, on our own. Very good at doing that. But that's not what you have been called to do. You have been called to make disciples of Joe Bloggs out there. You have been called to get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the church building and go out there and tell somebody about Jesus. You know, these past few years taught us a lot about ourselves. I know it did. It taught us how much we are in or a part of the community. And it's nice to know that some of our churches have responded and are out there doing something now in the church. As each area of your church leadership examines your own role in making disciples, I invite you to consider how Jesus might be calling you personally. What is he calling you to do? What has he said to you specifically? I want you to do something. What might that be? Now, I love this quote which says, A ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. God calls us to set sail. 
And once we're out on the raging sea, we see God and some new possibilities. Because, brethren, when you're out on the raging sea, you you come to realize that you cannot do it on your own. It's out of your hands. You need divine providence to guide you. And that's where Jesus steps in. He wants to guide us. He wants to help us. But we need to step out of the boat and go out there and do what he has commissioned us to do. The question is, do you dare get out of the boat? Or does it seem, hmm, no, not me, not me. But you know something, brethren, God is patient with us. When we can't seem to leave the comfort of the boat, he doesn't beat us up over it. He simply seeks to continue to encourage us. That's what he does. Brethren, the church was built on Jesus, not on anybody else. And if we take a moment and listen, we can hear that still small voice saying, come, come. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. If you want to have that true, that real experience of working with Jesus and him do something with you and through you, you've got to get out of the boat. Do you think you can do that? How many of you have challenged yourself? It's just a rhetorical question. How many of you have challenged yourself to do something for God or to allow God to use you? As I said before, if nothing else, the pandemic has shown Wilsdon how relevant we are right here in Wilsdon. I know it has because I've seen many different things happening which didn't happen before, but they're happening now. But that is just the start. Just a start. God wants you to see that there's a great work for you to do. He has called you. He has commissioned you. And he says, now go make disciples. Make disciples. Why? You see, we know why. And the answer is very simple. Because he's coming again. It's as simple as that. He has made a promise to humanity that one day he will return for those who are ready to meet him and in that promise he has commissioned us to do what he has called us to do in Matthew chapter 28 to go make disciples to help this community get ready to meet him you know we've, we've talked about it for many many years for decades that he's coming soon and I believe we've become complacent in that well he's coming yes but but Probably not in my lifetime. I finished that sentence for you because, for brethren, most of us think that. But how do you know? Jesus can come at any time. Any time. And we need to be ready to meet him. And we need to do what he has called us to do. And that is help others to be ready to meet him also. We've been playing church long enough. We've been playing games long enough. Now is time to respond to the call of God. Now is time to say, listen, I I need to do things differently. I've been in church a long time. I've seen, I've grown, I've learned, I've experienced. Now it's time for me to respond. Now it's time for me to take God at his word. He will use me if I allow him to. I want God to work something through me. I'm ready for that. Are you ready for that, church? Are you ready? No, no, no. Are you ready for Jesus to use you? Are you sure? So, brethren, make a determination that from today, you will do something different. If it's one person for Jesus, then that is your goal. Just one. Just one. If it's one person alone, You're going to touch him. You're going to reach out to them. If it's just one, whoever that might be, focus. think about them right now. This moment, think about that one person who you want to reach out to for Jesus. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about that. Don't think about the world and their army. Just one person. Just one. And in your thoughts, say, Lord, there's this one person that I want to reach for you. 
I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to say. But I'm going to be trusting you. Trusting you to give me what I need. Give me the words that I can speak. Give me the courage and the determination to go and say something. Pray for that person right now. Just close your eyes. Pray for them. Just a 20 second prayer. Nothing too long. Just enough for God to hear you. And as you close your prayer, simply say, Lord, I'm going to trust you and obey. As the song says, trust and obey. Because truly there is no other way. No other way. No other way. But simply trust in God. That's all we can do. Trust in him. And that's what he calls us to do. Can I open your eyes once again? And I want to talk to you as well now for a few seconds. You said that when I asked you how things have been with you and God, you said it's been good. God has blessed you. Throughout the week, you've seen him working miracles in your life and doing wonderful things for, he, for you. And sometimes we take that for granted because he is good. But in this moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and make a new commitment to God that, listen, God, I'm, I'm not going to take you for granted. Yes, you bless me. Yes, you sustain me. And I don't want to take that for granted anymore. But I want to simply recognize what you do for me, how you impact my life, and help me to impact somebody else. You want to stand to say, God, I thank you for who you are and what you have been doing for me. If you'd want to stand, please stand because I want to pray for you. Just think how God blessed you this week. What did he do for you? That grade you wanted to get, you achieved it. That a person, that, that boss at work was giving you grief, God dealt with them because you prayed and asked him to do that. That bill that you couldn't find the means to pay, somehow the money turned up and you were able to pay it. That job you wanted, God gave it to you. That's who he is. And we shouldn't take these blessings lightly. But still tell him thanks. Let's just bow our heads as I pray. Heavenly Father, we stand here this afternoon because we want to say thank you to you. Oftentimes we make an appeal to come to the front to give our lives to you. But that's not my appeal this afternoon. My, one's appeal, my appeal is an appeal of thanks. Where we can take a moment and simply thank you for what you have done for us and continue to do through us. We are learning that the best thing that we can do is to trust you and be faithful to you. Because in doing so, there are so many possibilities. And through this experience, there's a natural growth in that we give our life to you even more. Each and every day, we want to love you, want to serve you even more. So Father, as we come to you this morning, we say thank you. Because you have been ever so faithful. Even when we didn't deserve your faithfulness, you have been faithful to us. So as there is no other way, help us from this day forward to simply trust you and obey you in all that we do is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.